Words to that effect. <laughs> Hi everybody, Levi Clay here, and I'm back again for another soloing school lesson. This time we are going to be talking about the subject of thinking ahead while you are soloing. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to say, uh, as usual, a uh, huge thanks to VPix. I don't mention them enough. There's always the, you know, the thing up here. Uh, I'm a big, long-time VPix user. They support my channel, so you know I should say thanks to those guys. It's a great way to support the channel. If you do want to uh, support the channel, head on over to VPix, check their picks out. I've used the Medium Pointed for a very, very long time, about eight or nine years now. Absolutely love it. Uh, I do mix it up occasionally using a few different ones. I mean, I have a lot of them here. The bags and bags of the things like just everywhere. Uh, so I do, you know, mix them up and see which ones I'm feeling on the day. But today is a medium pointed day, so give it a go. Anyway, this question comes to you from one of my supporters over on Patreon.com, Patrick. He asks, and this is, a, I'll read that out the full question, and then I'll go into it. So he says, "What I found is that to construct good sounding lines when improvising, you really need to think ahead. You need to think of the upcoming chord or chords to be able to target specific chord tones and make use of good sounding guide tone lines. I know you often say that this is the key. I have two questions. Firstly, what is the best way to learn uh, learn that when you still need to use so much brain power for playing over the actual sounding chord? And secondly, am I correct?" to really be able to think ahead that I need to rely on patterns that are ingrained deeply into my subconscious to some point in regards to playing over the actual sounding chord. Otherwise, I won't have enough free brain power to focus on what's coming up. Therefore, I'm relying on fingering patterns, um, as bad as they can be if you only rely on them, blah, blah. You get, you get the idea. He, he rambles a bit there, but of course, I totally know what he means. And this is a huge, huge part of uh, the subject that I'm often dealing with with many of my students on Skype and that is RAM. If you're into computers, you understand what RAM is. Random access memory. That would be embarrassing if I got that wrong, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, it's how our computers process power. It's essentially your, your, the, the available memory you have for designating to different tasks. And I'd like to think of that and draw parallels to that when I'm talking about learning to improvise and play over chord changes, because you need to have a lot of RAM in order to be able to do all the things that Patrick's talking about here, which is thinking about the chord that you're on and also being aware of the chord that you're going to and how you're effectively going to get there and play some nice sounding vocabulary uh, on the way there. So it, it really is a, a battle, but there is a simple way to work on this. Now, in previous soloing school videos, the thing that I'm always talking about is triads and arpeggios and things like that. And that's a really good basis from which to build everything else around. If you're thinking to yourself in these big six, seven, eight note scales, uh, even nine note scales, actually I'm a big fan of combining three different scales into one for all of my note choice, Point is, nine notes is a lot of things to think about. If I'm playing over an A chord, volume helps. If I'm playing over an A chord, it's kind of helpful to know that A, C sharp, and E are the root, the third, and the four, uh, root the third and the fifth of that chord, right? And I can play that absolutely anywhere. So here's my. So I start adding a few more notes the more and more I play there, but the point is you can still always hear these A chords. Everything is about the, the chord that I'm always playing on. Now that pertains to what Patrick you know, is already struggling with, which is playing good sounding vocabulary on a given chord. You have to, of course, work on that. That is very important to just put on an A vamp. and be able to play vocabulary that just sounds like that chord, not worrying about chord changes, so.
I could just play endlessly on that A chord because I've got a lot of vocabulary that helps me to move around. As soon as you start introducing different chords into that, things are going to get a lot harder. So don't underestimate the skill of being able to improvise over one chord. Now, I, of course, was improvising all over the neck there. You want to limit yourself to single positions. So if you're just dealing with A around the ninth fret area, you could call it the C shape of the cage system. System. I've got my basic... And I start filling in all the blanks. That's me really getting familiar with that area of the neck, right? Um, so you spend that the time doing that. But we're talking about playing over chord changes here and thinking ahead. So in order to do that, the best way to deal with this is usually with just two chords, right? So before we deal with a full blues, let's just deal with two chords. Say we're playing a blues in A, which is what I played at the start, dealing with an A chord and a D chord, or an A7 and a D7. Now, before playing lines, before playing all this complicated vocabulary on A and then complicated vocabulary on the D, can you play a good note over A and can you play a good note over D? You know, I don't want you to just be aimlessly wandering around and looking for vocabulary. I want you to really have these strong melodic sensibilities to your playing. So when I'm playing on an A chord, you know, a great tone to play on that would be the third, C sharp. And then when I change to a D chord, again, the third, F sharp. Back to the third of A. Now, if I just uh, give you the basic vamp, so... Now, I don't have my loop set up, so I can't loop that, but you essentially have this, and this will sound like the chords, kind of. Two, three, four, and one. Two, three, four. Now on its own that doesn't really sound like much of course, but it's still a skill being able to feel the pulse. One, two, three, four, A, two, three, four, A, two, three, four, to D, two, three, four, two, three, four, back to the A. And knowing when those chords are changing, not based on counting, but feeling where those chord changes are, right? That's quite boring. What we want to focus on is that ability to just sit on that one note. So maybe that's C sharp. Now I've chromatically walked up to the F sharp there. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, ba da down, two, three, four, one, two. Just again walking to the F sharp, forcing myself. I didn't like that resolution. Don't like a fourth third actually. Now you notice as each chord changes, I'm landing on the third, right? And it doesn't matter what the chords are. If I add an E in there, it will be the same principle. I know that when I need to land on E, the third is that G sharp. So I could really play my chords A, D, and E. And I'm always having the sound of those chords as I'm doing it. So A. to my A. That's my 
D. A. Uh, A. Now, playing through um, a solo like that and just dealing with single notes, just where is the third on everything, is a very helpful skill to be able to do. If you take, um, you could take something like the first few chords on Autumn Leaves. So it's C minor, 7, uh, F7, B flat major 7, uh, E flat major 7, A minor 7 flat 5, D7, uh, G minor 7, and then G7. So when I'm doing that, if I'm improvising on that, you know, can you hit the thirds on each of those? Here's my uh, C minor. Here's my third of F. Here's my third of B flat. Third of uh, E flat. Third of, what's my next chord? Next chord is A. And then third of uh, D. Third of G minor. Third of G7. So when I'm thinking through that, you know, without a backing, it's it's hard, and you know, I want it to be kind of free time. But if I'm improvising through that, notice how I'm targeting the third on each chord as I as the chord changes. So C minor. There's my third of F. C minor. But if you analyze that, a lot of the time I'm landing on the third, and that's a huge way to help me do that. So how are you going to go about actually working on this? How are we going to encourage you to be focusing on this? So the answer really is you need to develop RAM speed so you can focus on where you are and where you're going. So I'm going to give you the endless arpeggio exercise, which I love. We're going to apply it to two things. We'll apply it to a blues and then we'll apply it to um why not? Let's do autumn leaves. So uh, endless arpeggio exercise is playing your arpeggios and we will play them, let's do quarter notes first. So you need to be confident in arpeggio positions in all five areas of the neck um, in order to do this fluently. A to D7, I'm gonna play a proper, the first anything, eight bars of a blues, right? So a bar of A, a bar of D, two bars of A, two bars of D, two bars of A. Okay, and I'm just going to play quarter notes. So A. Now I need to transition to D. And this is the skill, right? Being able to, as I'm playing this, think, what does D look like? I can land, move up to that uh, next note would be A. That's now my fifth of D. And I can continue up. I can keep going if I want. Uh, it would shift back to A, so... Now just playing chord notes is uh, kind of tricky for phrasing because you have very little to play on each chord, but if I play it at a bit more speed that will sound like this. not all that musical as I say if I then switch that to eighth notes play with a little bit of swing so da 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 Uh, same thing on autumn leaves would be uh, C minor, so to F, B flat, E flat major. 
Major 7. A minor 7 flat 5. D. So, um, yeah, transcribe those, of course. Everything is about transcription, right? Um, and, yeah, the exercise there is, is RAM speed. It's improving that ability to think on chord changes. There's hesitation when I'm doing it. But limiting myself to just those arpeggio tones is actually hugely helpful for me in the long run. If I can visualize chord changes using just the notes of the chord, then, you know, C minor goes from this to this. goes from this to this. Or if I wanted to play a little bit more outside on it. That's me playing B flat, right? got that a minus seven flat five let's play some locker in natural two on that d7 g minor what's that effect so there we have it, soloing school. I don't even know what part that is now, but hopefully that was of some use to you. I just want to say a huge thank you to these people over here. These are my supporters over on Patreon.com, or at least some of my supporters over on Patreon.com. They keep these videos coming to you. Patrick's name is up on there somewhere. Uh, Patrick is up there in the 50s. Uh, I feel he needs to come down to the 20s. I should check that. That means that that list needs updating. Um, but yeah, if you would like to join those guys, uh, you can do so for as little as a dollar, actually, supporting me on Patreon. Great way to support the channel. Of course, so is buying VPix. So is buying Transcribe. If you want a copy of that, you can let me know in the comments below and I'll send you a link from which you can get that. Check out my music um, and all of that good stuff. Lots of books on Amazon. Again, if you want to know where you can get those, let me know in that comment section below. I'm always happy to... Um, chat with you in that comment section help you out as much as I possibly can so anyway if you would like to check us out on Patreon click this button up here you can subscribe by clicking this button down here and you will see two more of my videos here and here and lastly I should really focus on that subscription thing click subscribe hit the bell notification hit like because YouTube YouTube is really good at not showing my videos to people that want to see them so if you enjoy them share them with your friends it really is a big help anyway guys much love and I will see you for another video again soon laters